Welcome to the show. Welcome to Toronto. Hey, ain't no thing but a swing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so people know uh, what the term rap means to popular music right now, but tell us what it meant uh, when you were coming up in the 60s and 70s, what that term meant. Well, rap meant um, the indictment. The indictment. You know, you know, indictment? The indictment. Yeah. Explain. Indictment means um, y- y- you're brought up on charges. Okay, yeah. So okay. That, that, yeah, so that yeah. was one meaning, like a, like a rap sheet? Well, no. Yeah, yeah. well, rap sheet came, yeah. came, came, came with the crime. You see, so, so rap basically meant two things. One, it was a sharp sound. Okay, like you a know, rap at the door? So you rap at the door, rap upside your head. You know, and it, it also meant uh, the blame. So that's really what rap meant. So, you so okay. uh, did it have any kind of musical or poetic meaning at that time, or those were the two? No, it didn't have any me- me- meaning or uh, uh, poetic meaning at that time uh, because uh, it, was, it was before the time that okay. it, it got that meaning. Before that time, it was just rapping, and rapping meant having a general conversation based on a mutual survival uh, strategies. Okay, so before rapping or emceeing as we know it now, there was a tradition called toasting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you describe what, what toasting was? Well, toasting was like uh, uh, reminiscing on um, the name of the game, which was cop and blow. That's if you even managed to cop. Cop meant to, to get what it was that you was after. And, uh, you know, then you would get it in one hand and lose it in the other. So basically, uh, toasting was a half myth, which is a half truth and half lie. Okay, and that was a more poetic tradition, right? Well, yeah, that was African-American folklore. Okay. It, it was equivalent to the blues, but only you had some yellows and some gray, grays in there, some pinks and some greens and stuff like that. Some different colors to the poetry. Yeah, it, had mo- it was more of a kaleidoscope, you know. Kaleidoscope describing the street life, basically. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. the street life and, and the various uh, aspects that uh, we had to go through, uh, the African-American people, just in order to survive. What made your take on toasting different from what you had heard before? Well, basically what I heard before was just um, mostly about sex and violence, uh, but a lot of cussing and a lot of fussing, uh, which, uh, you know, you don't hear those words in the Hustlers Convention. Uh, you don't hear no, no cussing. You hear fussing, but you don't hear no cussing, and you don't hear no curse words. You know, and you hear the strategies involved, the, the mental thoughts that's going on in the minds of the hustlers and how they're trying to outbluff each other. So you tried to take it a level a level deeper. I took it a level deeper. I didn't try. <laughs> you succeeded. Yeah. Uh, so this album it follows the rise and fall of two hustlers, Sport and Spoon. Right. What char- What what themes were you trying to explore through these characters? Well, basically, you know, I wrote the last verse first, and the last verse was, you know, you know. The real hustlers are ripping off billions from the unsuspecting millions who are programmed to think they can win. Can you repeat that one more time? I wrote the last verse. No, no, just repeat the line. Oh, the real hustlers are ripping off billions from the unsuspecting millions who are programmed to think they can win. It's like the lottery. You know, a lot of people play the lottery, you understand, but very few people win. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, what they win is nothing compared to what they've spent. So you wrote that line first. I wrote that line first, but it had to have some type of story, you know, to go with it in order to make it for it to make sense. You know, how does the real hustlers rip off being some unsuspecting means? Is it at the racetrack? Is, is it at the stock market? You know, is it at the shady deals going on? Is it with the cartels? It was, you know, so it was with all, all of the, you know, uh, the big time hustlers. We got one, run, one running for president now. So uh, rap pioneers like Chuck D from Public Enemy, they, they credit Hustlers Convention for its influence on rapping as we know it. But what's, what's super surprising is that, that that influence, how it was gained, because this album wasn't widely available. Uh, its popularity was by word of mouth. People were actually memorizing your lyrics and reciting them back to, to friends. Were you aware of that at the time? No, I was busy working on the next thing. I wrote a sequel to the Hustlers Convention. That's deeper than the Hustlers Convention. Mm. So, so you weren't aware that that album was having the influence it was having at that time? No, I, w- I was busy. Uh, 
uh, in the woodshed, um, developing my art. You know, in other words, I was covering a subject matter, mm-hmm. and I had to move on to the next subject matter. But the subject matter I was covering, you know, I had to have everything in it so that would be the last word on that matter. Now, if you want to make another evolution, then that's another subject matter, the difference between psychology, biology, uh, you know, and so on, so on and so forth. It's, it's a completely different field. So, so I was just covering that field. And, and then you moved on to the next expression. Yeah, I moved on to the next evolution. Yeah. How does it feel, though, to know you've had that kind of influence, that that album had the kind of influence that it's had? Well, I would feel better if I would have gotten paid for it. What happened in the, in the business side of it that well, you weren't hu- compensated? They, they hustled it. They stole it. They stole it. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, the lyrics are, are registered with the Library of Congress, but uh, they stole it. I couldn't afford a lawyer to, to bring suit. Uh, it, it would have took— Against the, the record label? Yeah, against the record label and against the, uh, the publishers that uh, uh, st- uh, um, stole my intellectual property rights. What about hearing from these guys like Chuck D and Ice T? Who has reached out to you in hip hop? Not, not one of them. The only one that ever reached out to me in hip hop was a Q-tip from a Tribe Called Quest. And what did Q-tip say? Hmm. Well, Q-tip respected who I was, and you know, you know, so it didn't even have nothing to do with the Hustlers Convention. It was just, you know, my contribution to, uh, to rap. Because you got to understand, you know, hip and hop is that's a shotgun wedding, you know. What do you mean a shotgun wedding? <laughs> Meaning hip, mar- uh, hop, hop married hip. Shotgun means like you get married <laughs> or else. Okay, so basically, you know, they said, uh, you know, because when rap first came out, you know, rap was uh, uh, politically uh, informative, you know, and, and, and politics is policy, you see. So, uh, you know, the record company execs, they all got together and said, listen, man, we, we got to put this in another time frame, man. We got we to take this concentrate and make Kool-Aid out of it. Hmm. So well, what are we going to do? Well, you know, so because you know, this thing is getting big and we need to get a piece of the action. These are the hustlers now. You dig it? So you feel like hip-hop, uh, as we know it now, is watered down, is less political than what it was initially? Well, listen, you know, a hop, a hop is a two-footed uh, leap, and we need a quantum leap. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's the saying, you know, a hop, skip, and a jump. <laughs> you know, so I had to go to skip and I had to go to jump. You know, so I I went to skip, I went to jump, and and jump is off the chain. Is there any any rap that you've heard that that's inspired hope? That's made you feel like this is carrying the um the spirit that that you uh you know brought to the music. If uh, it can't teach then. me anything, then then it can't reach me. Is there any that that is teaching you and reaching you? No, there's nothing that's teaching me and reaching me. You know, because uh, a little bit of knowledge in the hands of fools is dangerous. It's mm-hmm. big business. That's what it is. I'm not a businessman. I'm a busy man. Where, where do you get your inspiration to keep going and keep doing what you do? I get my I get my inspiration from God, and after that, I add all the prophets, one hundred twenty-four thousand of them. Any any particular religious tradition? Or? No, I get my information from God, <laughs> and on one hundred twenty-four thousand prophets. So I got a lot of inspiration. <laughs> okay. I, I have time for one more question for you uh, before we let you go. Uh, all this week on this show, we've been asking our guests about words that have helped them get through hard times. Literature, poetry, something that has sustained you, words that have sustained you. Is there mm. Are there any that come to mind you'd like to share? Yeah, rhythms and sounds and leaps and bounds, scales and notes and endless quotes. Hey, my soul being told, hypnotizing while improvising is mentally appetizing. And those are your own words, I'm guessing? Yeah, that's my own words. <laughs> <laughs> when did you write those? Well, I wrote that uh, back in 69. What is it about those words that, that sustain you? Well, it's rhythms and sounds and leaps and bounds, scales and notes and endless quotes. Hey, my soul being told. So I'm bearing my soul. Hypnotizing while improvising is mentally appetizing. So I got to re-hypnotize myself in order to keep from being hypnotized by the media. And you do that through words? Hmm? And you've always done that through words? Uh, yeah, words and experiences. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jalal, for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure, Shah.